I'm Ide Kudum, partner at Gingerbread Capital. And as, you, as uh, Claire said, I've been in Africa, first trip since post-pandemic, since I left the 21st. And then I went, uh, visited my family, went to Accra for New Year's. I highly recommend it. Amazing food, amazing weather. And then I came back to Lagos for a wedding, which I'm going to weave into the story that I'm going to talk about today. Um, getting into the money mindset. And there's a few things. I always like to know, I mean, everybody here is a restaurateur. Who is actually like, which one of you are cooking in the kitchen? It's your vision of the food. Okay, most, most. And then the rest are, who is kind of the business side helping alongside? Okay, oh, it's actually half and half, which is really nice. Um, that's always a great combination. So for those that are the visionaries, the food ideas coming out of, it's always great to partner with somebody that can be that partner that's on the business side, because there's a lot to do uh, in your businesses. And having th those kind of duality is always a great thing. So our portfolio companies, some of them you might know. So I focus on venture capital. And venture capital, we're looking for the types of companies that are trying to scale to become billion dollar businesses um, and changing lives. And all of these are founded by, by women. You might know Zola, the wedding registry, or one of our few food investments is in Goodles. And you'll be hearing from um, Jen Zazut as part of the next couple of days, or Pear Eyewear are some of the consumer brands in our portfolio that you may have heard of. And then a little about me. I like to say my spirit animal is tiger. The reason I'm here is Emily. We went to college together. So talk about friendships for life and building and working alongside your friends. That's what this is. Em called me, to, and Claire is a friend, and they told me about what was going on here. And I was like, I'd be happy to bring whatever talents and ideas and suggestions that I can to, to this group. So Tiger, Tigress, my company before this, Tigress Ventures. I'm surprised I'm not wearing, oh, there's a little splash there. Uh, I tend to always be wearing something orange and black. Did, I started my career at Goldman Sachs, so did the finance thing. You know, Em stayed in this world her whole career. And I switched to the other side that kind of, for me, it's, I was a psych major undergrad. And so I wanted to combine the people element with the money element and kind of pull it all together and venture capital. That's kind of what I get to do. Um, and so I left, started my own business, and then I joined Gingerbread Capital. Normally, when I show this, I show the like more professional. But this was me last Tuesday at this <laughs> wedding in Nigeria. And when I was like thinking about the money mindset, I got to see it in action in the Nigerian economy. Because one of the things that I want to teach you about, the money mindset is all about being able to tell a story. That is the key to raising money. It is the ability to communicate the vision. And in your vision, it's about the food that you're making. It's about the experience you're giving in your restaurant. And you're trying to tell somebody that you give me a little money, or a lot of money, and I can take this idea that started in my kitchen or started in my mind and turn it into a place that will have hundreds, thousands of people coming. And depending on the ambition and the scale of what you're trying to do, millions if you're trying to turn it into an empire. But it all starts in your kitchen, in your mind, in the thing that got you excited about food, taking this to others. So I want you to think about, for today, as you're listening to all the different things, how you are going to craft the pitch of your story to be able to tell about yourself, about your business, to make somebody think, hey, this is something I would like to put money behind. Because all of these things are risky, but the, the goal is to kind of try to de-risk it by giving information in a compelling way. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. And you can think about it throughout the course of the day. And at the end of the day, you'll get to practice it. And as you leave from here, you'll practice it. And so what are those elements of the perfect pitch that get you in this money mindset? And before that, always need to know, where are you starting from? So how many of you bootstrapped your businesses? Like you haven't taken any money? You've, or you've taken, like it's mostly been funded by you. OK, see, a lot, a majority. And with women, that often is the case. How many of you have raised like 100,000 or less from like friends, family, within? OK. And then some that have raised between 100 to 500? Great. More than 500 to a million? OK. And more than a million, right? And as you see, like this is very indicative of the demographic breakdown of how capital flowing to female founders works. It's not great. Most of the times, we do it ourselves because we can't or we don't know the resources or how to do it. So one of the goals in you know, what we're doing at Gingerbread, although we're not necessarily investing in the restaurant business, but in there's a lot of companies out there, 
is really trying to shift this dynamic by getting capital into the hands of women so that you don't just have to use all your life savings to be the ones to do it. You figure out the resources and know how to tell the story when you're in that moment. You need to know who to talk to to get what you need and the funding that you need. So the journey, my dress started as that piece of fabric. The bride in, in Nigerian culture, our big social things are weddings and funerals. It is just like the social events of the calendar are weddings and funerals. And this was a small, intimate wedding of 500. A normal Nigerian wedding has 1,000 to 2,000 people, and you need to feed all of them. You need to make sure they all of them are having a great time, eating well, all of that. And that means money. And that means there's a lot of vendors under there that are going to help make that bride's vision come to reality. And one of those is the fashion piece of it. Um, and the fashion and the food side come together. And I think you'll see the corollaries in somebody that's a designer to somebody that's a chef and restaurateur as to how they build out their business. So the bride picked that fabric, and then she gives it to us, and we get it. And she says, go make a dress, whatever you want. But it has to be in that fabric. I live in New York City. I haven't lived in Nigeria. I haven't been since 2019. I'm like, how do I find a seamstress that is going to turn a, a, a piece of fabric into something? So as many of you know in your world, word of mouth. You reach out to people, and you're like, have you eaten somewhere that you've really loved? Or does somebody know about you? And you ask them. And that's what I did. I reached out to a friend of mine. I was like, do you know a seamstress who has great style? And I said, do you have a seamstress? And she gave me this woman who, through a virtual fitting, did that. I, I met her one time. I landed in Lagos on the 22nd. She showed up in my hotel, brought this dress. I stepped into it. She made one adjustment, sent it to my hotel when I came back from Accra. That's talent. And I believe everybody in this room, when you are gifted at something, that's the same gift that you have with food. You know, you see an ingredient. This is a fabric. Yours is a piece of just some sumptuous meat or vegetable that you can then turn into a masterpiece that people are like, how did that happen? And so the scale of it is you don't have two bridesmaids. You have 30 to 40 to 50 of them. <laughs> and they all took that same fabric. And you notice no two dresses alike. And that's the beauty of this economy. And that's the beauty of the food industry as well. There's restaurants on every block, but they can all coexist because you all put your own twist on it and you turn it into something where it's competition, but it's also an ecosystem that can thrive where everybody, there's a dish for everybody and there's a dress for everybody. You just have to put your spin on it. And that's what you do it at scale. And so what do you have to do to make yourself stand out in that world? I think of it as like five key elements to a perfect pitch. It's the compelling backstory, the differentiated business model, the competitive landscape, your scalability, and always, always your audience. You need to know your audience. And so let's kind of break this down. And I'll break it down from the standpoint of kind of using that experience that I had. When you're trying to tell that compelling backstory, it, you start out with, what is the problem or the opportunity? And in your world, the problem or the opportunity is you are trying to create a restaurant, a catering business, a food uh, product service that is going to serve a community that you are passionate about. And the big thing here is, like, how are you uniquely qualified for this? And you're, one of these things, women don't like to brag, you need to be able to humbly, not so humbly, because guys don't humbly, brag about your accomplishments. What have you done that has put you in this position, that you launched this restaurant, that you are about to launch this restaurant, or you're launching number three, four, or five and scaling? It is OK to brag. And it, in fact, when you're asking for money, it is necessary. Because it validates that you have, there's a reason that you are here. You deserve to be here. And you can take what you've done and take it to an even bigger if you are able to talk about that self. And then you know, one of the things that you are always thinking about is like, how are you unique? What is different? Is it the, the, the style of the food? Are you doing kind of a cuisine that's unique in your area? Or are you taking elements of the thing that is about this area? That, you've, that hasn't been seen before. Because everything has been done before, but you're trying to say that you've found a special way that you can take it to another level. And then, but the key is your business model. You can have the best food ever, but if it costs you so much to get the ingredients or to pay the lease and all of these things that like you never make money, you will not stay in business long. And the restaurant business is a tough business. Because when you deal with things like real estate, when you're dealing with things like staffing and, and high turnover in those industries, 
the ability to look at what, you're, what it's costing you to do something versus what you're charging is really crucial. And you don't have to be a finance major. You don't have to be like an Emily. You should know an Emily. Like, <laughs> those are great people to know. But like, you can, do, you can sense that at the basic level of how much is it costing me? What money am I putting out there in the world? And am I getting enough? And one of the things that women often don't charge enough for is their time. There is value in your time. And you need to mark that into the pricing of your restaurant. You are part of what has made this special. And there, there's money in that. And there's value in that. So do not underestimate it. And the most key thing is most of them like, oh, I won't pay myself. The sign of a good restaurant, the sign of a good business, is the founder CEO gets paid. Right there. Right there. You should not not take, I know you have the equity in your business, but you need to pay yourself. You know that you are growing and you are thriving when you can also pay yourself in addition to everybody else around there. So you have to think about that as you're thinking about the, the business model. So what are you trying to solve? How much is it costing you? And then the key is how to retain your customers. In this world, it's pretty clear. Your food's got to be good. If the food's not good, they're not going to come back. But it's also more than that. If the food is not, the food is great, but then you also have to make sure that everybody knows about you. One of the coolest things that I noticed in Nigeria, which, you know, the average, the average um, Nigerian makes 339,000 naira, which is around $450 a month. But the people that stand out, everybody knows a Nigerian. Where there's oil or colleges and universities, we are there. So we're there everywhere in the world. But one of the things that is that they're able to find a little thing that helps them stand out. In the restaurants that I went to, the thing that they were doing was the bathroom. The bathrooms in all of these restaurants had the most amazing lights made for Instagram. And everybody, the girls go to the bathroom, the line for the bathroom's there, but they're all stopping at the bathroom and doing these amazing selfies that then they post, tag the restaurant. And it was just, it was incredible to see. So your bathrooms are marketing opportunities. <laughs> Take it from the Nigerians. It was spectacular what you're seeing in the bathrooms. So you said house, check. Exactly. <laughs> Go make your bathrooms Instagrammable, because the lines to the ladies' room is long. Give them something to do. So retaining customers, giving them that experience. It's about the food. It's about the ambiance. It's about all of it. The competitive landscape, you, like sitting in this room. Your competition to each other, but it doesn't have to mean that it's a zero-sum game. But you need to understand who's playing in your market, who's doing the exact type of food, and don't be like, oh, there's no, somebody's doing it. And if not, they're eating at home. Like, there is always an alternative to what you're doing. So you need to understand who's playing like you're playing, who's doing something differently, who's at the exact same scale as you, and who is at a little bit ahead that you admire. And so you need to understand all of that when you're thinking about the competitive landscape and be able to say it. Don't act like you don't know who the competition is. State the competition, because that shows that you know your market. So don't shy away from it. You'll just be like, I'm better because. Uh, but don't shy away from talking about the competition, because they're there. And any investor in your, in your business is going to go be like, well, how are you different than x, y, z? Be ready for that question, and be ready to answer it head on. And then do you have like a competitive moat, which is the thing that kind of can differentiate you? If you have two you know, Mexican restaurants next to each other, what would make you different from the other? And what is going to keep people coming to yours or talk more highly of, or you can charge more money than the competition? So you need to always think about how can you make yourself stand out? You don't have to be the only one. You just have to be slightly better or a lot better. The, more, the, the better you are, the better it is from the standpoint of how much you can charge for the experience of people getting to enjoy your product or service. And then the thing is, Scale, thinking about really being honest about how do you want to scale your business, right? It is OK to just say, I want to have my one restaurant, and I'm going to make it the best restaurant. It is going to be a destination that people come from all over the world to come to. No, everybody thinks, oh, well, if you have one, you need to become like you know, Union Square Hospitality and have like all of You need to think about yourself as an individual. What is going to make you happy? What is going to make you want to get up and do this grind every day? And if it's just a single place that is yours, that is your, your stamp, do that. Don't let anybody pressure you to say you have to scale bigger and you have to do all these other things if that is not what you're trying to do. This, you took the leap to go into this, so you need to make sure that you're doing the thing that you're trying to do. And so if it's one, the type of capital that you need should reflect the, the type of business that you're going. 
Don't call a venture capitalist if you really just want a single restaurant. That is not the right money for you. There's different buckets of money. Venture capitalists are looking for things that you're going to scale across the whole country, and it's going to be billions of dollars, and it's going to come out in five to seven years. Like, that is not necessarily the lifespan of how a restaurant business works. So match the capital that you're looking for to the aspirations that you have. But also, don't shy away from dreaming big. If it is that you want to be Danny Meyer, go after it. You, like, think about yourself in that mindset. Don't think, oh, well, I can only be this. If you're thinking big, think big. And then it becomes, how do I build the relationships? How do I build the networks that will help me scale and grow? But don't limit your aspirations to just one, if that's what you want. If you want to be big, think about big. And then it's about creating the pathways that will get you to big and building the networks. And you being here, you being in New York, you being in the finance capital, you taking the time to invest in yourself to do this to start your year, that's exactly the kind of thing that will start you getting on that mindset. Because a lot of people thought about it, but you actually did it. You showed up in this room, and that shows that you are willing to invest in yourself and your business. And so also think about every, like little miles, big milestones start from little milestones. Track those milestones as you get them, and, as, and be, be happy and pleased to talk about them. It is important that people can celebrate your successes, know about your successes, and, and get it talked about. Because the best thing that happens is when you're not in the room and somebody's talking about your restaurant, you, the combination of both, right? Because so often when you're the chef, you're behind the scenes and everybody knows. It's important that you have a personal brand that is associated with your food, but also with you showing that you are the owner, operator, restaurateur behind that vision. So don't shy away from being like, I'm just the, I'm just the food. No, you are, you are both. You are the food and the business. So see yourself as that brand, because it's important. And that's how you will start to get known as both the person behind the food and the business. And then one of the things that it was, is interesting is when you see uh, a bunch of different things then take to scale. Because it can be a single restaurant, or it can end up being something that when like, it enters my world, it becomes technology. So you saw that it was a single seamstress. There was a bunch of different seamstresses. Well, that problem of a lot of custom food or a lot of custom uh, things being need to done at scale leads to a technology solution. And so maybe what you're doing and what you're seeing is something that can become something bigger. So in the context of the Nigerian ecosystem, a it was a guy, unfortunately. But whatever. It's still a good guy. <laughs> it's still a good idea. But he saw this concept that like a lot of wedding parties where you have 50, 60 people need to scale up and need to put groups together. And he built this platform, fitted.ng, where it's like a dual-sided marketplace, where the tailors come in, can get all the fit measurements for the 50 people and do that. And then on the other side, it can be a lead gen source for, you, for the people that were the, the tailors. And so it, it's turned it into a platform where this is now something that a VC might look at. Because it's tech, and it can be scaled from not just Nigeria, but globally. So when you think about what you're doing, if there's aspects of your business that then turn around and you see, like connecting the dots, and that's kind of how Seamless came to be, Grubhub, they saw that a lot of people like to order food, and there wasn't an easy way to do it. And you built a platform that connects it. So you can start with the food. And if you're thinking bigger, or if something comes to mind and you see, huh, there's the ability. That's how something like Gold Belly came to be, right? You want something in New Hampshire, and I live in New York. How do I get it? So that's kind of the evolution of where a food and a restaurateur thought, oh, everybody should be able to experience my food and my uh, ability and built a platform on it. So that's when something adds technology to it and scales it into something where it can be from one location to many. So think about that. Is there something in what you're doing? Maybe. Not necessarily. But when you think about how your business and you grow, that's kind of what it is. You, people can come to your single location. Maybe they loved it so much, they're like, I wish I could have it in North Carolina. And then you figure out, maybe I can do that. And then it can go from there. So those are options when you think about scalability, when you leverage technology. And so the last and most important thing is you are always presenting to an audience. If it's an investor, you're talking to them about the fundamentals of the business and why you think with X amount of dollars you can scale it. You can return them whatever multiple that they're looking for. Because they're not. this isn't charity work when you're looking for outside capital. They want a return on that money. 
Or they want, I mean, they could be like, just want guaranteed reservations, and that works too. You just need to make sure you understand what they're looking for before you take their money. The worst thing you can do, especially if you take, give equity to somebody, is to do, uh, match it with somebody that's not aligned with your vision of how you want to run your business. Because once you drop below 50%, you can be removed from your own business. And that's one thing you should always think about when you take in like equity capital and give up a per ownership in your business. Make sure you are aligned with whoever you're taking the money from. And then if it's a customer, the real th is there, it's the food, the experience. What is it that's going to make them feel like, this is my favorite place. I want to come here all the time. And that's, I think, what you spend most of your time thinking about is that customer experience. But I believe here that you're also wanting to think about what if I could have 100,000, 200,000, a million dollars to take my restaurant to the next level, what would that look like? And so spend today thinking about how do you craft the narrative? How do you talk about your business? How do you talk about yourself? How do you talk about your market and your landscape that says this restaurant, this food concept, this empire that I'm thinking of building is going to be something that is going to stand out. Clearly, you've stood out to James Beard. You know, the foundation is, has its eye on you. You've got your eye on them. You are now, you've now stepped into a network that is going to help you think through this and expand it. But always think about it with your audience in mind. The same pitch to an investor is not the same pitch to a customer. So really make sure that you're talking about what's in it for that person to really make them feel like it's not generic, it's about them. And so to kind of close it, let me make sure I'm on time, because I'm going to open for Q&A. Oh. 90 seconds. I always say, if you had, let, it's the elevator pitch concept or whatever, if you had 90 seconds, could you tell somebody about your, your restaurant, your business? It's really hard. You should try it. Like, all you have to do is just take your phone out Like at some point, just turn the timer on and start talking for 90 seconds. You will see it is extremely difficult to do unless you've thought about the elements in advance and then cut the words down to make sure they can fit in that time horizon. So one of the things, 90 seconds is where you start, but you may get five minutes, 10 minutes longer. But if you can do it at 90, you can then expand it with the more time you have. So what I would say, and I, you know, I'll leave this behind for you guys to be able to do, think about if you had 90 seconds, could you fit in a, a, a compelling narrative that talks about your backstory, the differentiation in your business model, the competitive landscape, your ability to scale, and scaling may mean open another location, or scaling may mean take on more um, restaurant, like clients, customers coming to the restaurant. It doesn't have to just be like go from one to 50, 50 chains. Like it doesn't have to be. Scale is what you are, the goal of why you want the money to do for you. And then the audience. What is it that's going to differentiate it for you? Start off with the, with the 90 and see what was missing. See when the beeper goes off, where were you when you were talking? Because that's one of the things you realize that you ramble a lot more than you think about, unless you're thoughtful about how you put it together. Once you can do it in 90, you can do it in any kind of time allotment that you're given. But 90 is really hard. And so that's why I always say, start with 90, hit those bullet points, and then practice, and then from there you can you can go back. And you're in a room with 50 other women that like today you may come across and, and get to know each other, follow up and practice with each other because somebody else in the sector who's not maybe like down the block from you can be able to hear it and understand and give you feedback and comments in a way that like somebody that's totally out of your field might not get. But you should also practice it with somebody that's not in the restaurant business, like a cust like a customer or if, if, they can under, if different audiences can understand what you're trying to say, that means that you've successfully been able to communicate the message. And so that money mindset is really being able to talk about your, your restaurant, your business, in a way that somebody says, this is exciting. I want to put some money in it. And I feel confident that I'm going to get that return back. Uh, and that is basically the key in all of this. The, it's built on relationships. And it's built on being able to articulate what you are doing in a way that is compelling and in a way that is going to get people, whether it's investors, whether it's customers, coming back over and over again to then build your business to the vision that you have. Thank you, guys. Yeah.